when Dan asked me to do this, you know, I sat down and I thought, how do you unwind 50 years? <laughs> so anyway, I told him, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. He, we were talking over the phone, and <clears throat> we've been over a lot of miles, a lot of lumps, and uh, there's been a time or two that I've had a problem, and I've called Dan, and he says, well, you think we ought to talk about it? And I said, well, we just did. <laughs> and so, all righty. This is going to be a little stranger meeting you've probably ever been. If you guys got some questions at a time, why, let me know. We'll kick it around. And uh, it's, it's an open meeting. So I'll probably jump around a little bit because so many of the things that uh, I uh, did or didn't do at the time, whatever, uh, I do want to say, you know, I get all the accolades for this and that, but there's a lady sitting over here <clears throat> that's really the anchor. You know, when you're 300 miles from home, 5 o'clock, Friday night, by the time you get home, her perfume is already evaporated and things are not so great. And she put up with that for many, many years. She did travel with me when we started the Pro Harvest. But anyway, it takes a great lady to put up with a serviceman, I'll tell you that. Because uh, sundown, 5 o'clock, never makes any difference at all to a true serviceman. Time is your time until it's done. And that's the way that I've operated for, well, 25 years with the custom hut cutters. So anyway, let us get off of that. You know, uh, Dan was talking about starting out with the actual flow. <clears throat> I just made a little list of the things that we had to make it do. And this was a new animal, you know. we. Uh, made mistakes, but anyway, you had you had wheat, barley, rye, milo, corn, fescue. That was a good one. Clover, soybeans, lespidies, edible beans, oats, and all the oil crops. Now, and every one of them takes just a little bit different, not much. That's one thing about the extra flow that you didn't have to screw around with it too much. Uh, we, like Dan said, we, we had some pretty rough opposition in the beginning with competition. It wasn't all the truth. But I had this one situation where that, uh, we just traded four red ones for four green ones. And everything was going real well. And it's Saturday afternoon. It seemed like these bad things always happened on Saturday. <laughs> And uh, he called me and uh, he said, I broke a chopper shaft, straw chopper shaft. Well, that's a big chunk of iron. And we did not have one on the trailer at that time because this was the first that we'd had that problem. And I said, okay. So I got on the phone and I probably called Dan and I called everybody else trying to find one. And the only availability was at the plant. And before I got off the phone with that one, about two hours later, he called me and says, another one went down. Well, he was not a very happy camper. And where we were located then with the trailer, the guy had a nice plane. But he says, I, none of my boys or I have night flying license. But he says, I'll get one. So anyway, it took about five hours, but I put together a situation where the he would fly the plane into the plant, or into Moline. One of the, my best guys there would get the choppers, take them to the airport, and make arrangements to keep the <clears throat> airport service open because we had to fuel that plane at midnight. Anyway, to make a long story short, we had those laying on the ground beside the combine the next morning at 7 o'clock. 10 o'clock, he was in the field. And uh, you can imagine what kind of a to-do that stirred around the place. But these straw choppers plagued us for quite some time. And uh, 
I'll get in a little later on to when we had the uh, people out of the race scene come out the field, but <laughs> this Kennedy fella, he's something else. Uh, they're, they were getting the plane ready for everybody, the big jet, and Dan knew I needed some choppers, so he goes and takes two seats out of the airplane and puts two choppers in there. I'm sure somebody was surprised. <laughs> But it made a big story the next week in all the company papers by the president of the company takes parts to Pro Harvest. So, but anyway, uh, I'm going to get into this Pro Harvest thing. Uh, as Dan said, uh, we milled that around. I, I had really had the thing like that on my mind since back in about 1964 when I done the. Uh, combine patrol which started in Texas and we had a it was just a big question searching for what people wanted and didn't want and we went all the way to Canada talking to every customer that had a combine and it was really comedy in a lot of cases back then it was custom harvesting then was strictly family and <laughs> you'd see them back an old Chevrolet truck down in the ditch pull the sideboards off, run the combine up on there, and generally it was a, a gleaner or a massey, drop the header down on the cab of the truck and slide the boards up underneath it and take off. Well, the older machines that were chain drive, they couldn't do that, and they only had about a 10 mile maximum. So they'd take the chains off, put a gin pole under the back end of it, hike it up on the truck and take off down the road backwards. <laughs> And there was even at that time some where they uh, were pull machines. You got to have five or six pull machines. It was uh, quite a thing. And on the pro har uh, <coughs> combine patrol, there again, didn't make any difference what color you had. If you was down, we'd help you out. And I covered this in a little bit with the group this morning, but I was in Hill City, Kansas. I got and just barely made it into the restaurant that night and came out about nine o'clock and there's two guys sitting on my truck and another one was standing there and he says, we hear that you work on people's combines. I said, yeah, ours first, but yes. He says, well, we've got a machine that we've got to do something with. Our farm customer told us to get it out of the field. We couldn't fix it. It was a brand new combine. And uh, I said, well, what's it doing? He says, well, we can't get anything but flour on one side. And so I said, well, I've got an 8 o'clock appointment in the morning. But where's the machine? I'll be glad to look at it. He said, it's in the field. And I said, well, if you can get it somewhere where I can look at it in the morning, we'll see what we can do with it. About 5.30, 6 o'clock, they was banging on my door. And I went out there. And the guy said, we got the combine. I said, where is it? They said, it's across the street. So, <laughs> so anyway... We went over there and I looked at it and I dropped the tailgate on the back down and it wasn't too hard to see that they didn't have a problem up front. They had an air control problem because half of the gate was plumb clean. There wasn't an ounce of paint on it and the other half was perfectly painted. So I said, guys, you got an air problem. Pull the, pull the tin wear off. Of course, on those, the engine was down there in the belly and you had to take all the tin wear out and it took a while, but anyway. We get to it and it had, those had the airboard in them. Well, when we got it out, it, it was like this. So consequently, it was blocking all the air on one side and you're getting all of it on the other side and it was just milling the wheat. So they took it out and I said, you got what do you got for two before's? And they said, well, we've got two six-footers. So I said, drill a couple of holes in them and clamp them onto that end of that. And they looked at me like I was crazy. But anyway, we put that on there, and the, there was a clo tree close enough there. We put the, down the crotch of that tree, and I said, now, two of you guys get on them two before's. And since that was a welded assembly, there was nothing you can do but just bend it. So we actually forced that back into a, a uh, fairly parallel line, put it back in the machine, and, and I went on my way because I didn't have to 
stay around until they put it all together. But anyway, I was up in North Dakota coming back from Canada. And I was in one of these towns where the courthouse was in the middle of the square. I stopped for a stoplight and I seen a guy running across that way. I drove over to the other corner and I had to stop again. I seen him running that way. Then I turned the other way and I seen him start running. I said, well, you must be wanting to see me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I stopped and, and he came over to the curb and he says, you remember me? And I said, I remember your face, but that's all. He said, well, I was the guy at Hill City that you fixed my combine. And he says, you know, we never had a minute's problem with it after that. So I guess sometimes what goes around comes around. But anyway, uh, I always enjoyed helping people. We, uh, in the process of getting Pro Harvest started, there was many, many people involved in creating that entity in the company, which has now become a total entity and part of the company. Uh, Dan, gentleman standing around back here somewhere, Manahan, and, and uh, Cam Barrett, I, I can name probably a dozen or more people. And this thing kind of had been simmering from probably five, six, eight years with little things done, piling up parts or head of the combines and all this kind of stuff, but nothing really worked. Uh, so anyway, before I went to China the first time, uh, we were in the, up in the Chicago area, we got together with Von Allen, and I don't know whether Von's going to be here or not, but Dan and, and several of the other guys, <coughs> and finally agreed on, when I got back, I would take a, a tour for the summer start in Texas, go all the way to Canada, deciding what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And then in 1985, we actually agreed on the logo. I think it was 85 when then we set up the logo. Uh, and uh, I had already pretty well worked out where we was going to go and how we were going to go. And the purpose of it was to uh, supply parts and service because you can't imagine if you had a dealership that you sold five combines and all at once you had 105 combines out there, uh, you don't know where to go or what to do. So consequently, uh, our intent was to not have a machine down over two days because it's expensive. Back, back then it was over $2,000 a day. So uh, that was the intent of that. Okay, now then, <coughs> we got the trailer on when we came back, and I, uh, a guy that I'd worked with in Kansas City, and his name was Les Hearn. Uh, we were two people that seemed like it uh, <coughs> so well matched that I honestly, standing here, I can tell you, he could start a telephone conversation with somebody on a, some problem out there, and he'd have to go do something and I'd take over the phone and finish the conversation. So, and we understood how each other thought, worked and so forth. And when this started, uh, we really had a, quite an overload. As for instance, we had combines come down to Texas and the guy said, well, our dealer said Pro Harvest would help you put it together and they just have all the header parts piled up in a pile. <laughs> and. Uh, Sometimes they'd be short a pump, or they'd be short this or short that. So, uh, so anyway, that's the way it started. And uh, uh, all the purpose of it also was to be ahead of the problems. Now, the custom harvester is always the one to know first what's the matter with the machine because they're way ahead of you guys. They're harvested out of there, but they've already been in the field long enough to burn the paint off most of the places before you ever see the combines or your wheat's ready. So that allowed us to forward that information into engineering and into the plant, and many things were changed overnight. And that's how fast the response was from what the information we gained in the field. But anyway, uh, we had a couple of real tragedies. When they went from the IH engine to the uh, new engine, uh, 200 hours, everything was going beautiful. We thought that was, while well, we were really cooking. 
about 200 hours, boom, the first one went down. The guy called me and he says, I can see plumb through my engine from standing on the ground. And uh, so it became a common phenomena on that engine. And we were able to get an engine out of engineering and an engine out of the plant to take care of the two problems that we had overnight. After that, we loaded the trailer up with piston sleeve. We had, we had to go back to a, a sleeve and piston assembly that was used in the tractor because they had mismade the pistons that was in those machines. And what had happened is the second ring would break, score the wall, you'd lose the oil, and out it went. So anyway, we set up to where that we could, if you went down, your machine went down, you brought it into a dealer that we had set up five o'clock tonight, you could have it back tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock. We overhauled an engine about one a night, and the paint was always still wet uh, when they went back on the machine. Forgive me, but I've had a request that you get closer to the mic. Okay, closer. I'll get it over here. What, what, there we go. Sorry, you're not able to hear it, so get a little closer. All right. And anyway, um, we had it worked out to where that we had the parts set up and arranged so that uh, when that engine came in, and with the dealerships, we were always working ahead on this thing. They would pull the engine, set it on the floor, and Les and I would overhaul it. I don't know how many of those engines that we went over. We were still overhauling them in Montana, so that'll give you some kind of an idea. And uh, we had one that was really a gooser. Uh, a guy called in and he says, my engine's blew it up on my combine. I says, where's your combine? He says, it's on the highest hill in the whole country. I can't get it down because it's not safe. So I found an engine. It happened to be a 1660 or 60, I think it was. Anyway, we found a complete engine for him. Loaded it up on the truck, put a, a fork loader up on that and all the equipment it needed and we sent that guy down there and on top of the mountain, he overhauled his combine, puts a new motor on it. And uh, so that just kind of shows you some of the things that we got into. So, uh, so uh, and, and one of the strange things, we had a cost reduction on some stuff. And excuse me, one of the, one of the things they cost reduced was a pulley down on the header, three band pulley. Well, that was kind of like the engine. We had 100% failure on those things. You could replace them and replace a belt. You may get a day or two days out of it. So we were calling all over the United States to old dealers trying to get old stock. And that's how we survived that summer with that problem. So, uh, and another incident we had, this is another one of those Saturday afternoon deals. The guy called me about five o'clock and he says, my hydrostat went down. I says, well, where is it? And he told me, and it was in really nowhere, way in the boonies. And I said, well, what do you got? He says, well, I've got a two-speed. And I said, you got what? A two-speed. I says, there ain't no two-speeds out here. He says, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't have nothing like a two-speed uh, motor on the trailer. There wasn't one. He had the only one, I think, in the United States. But anyway, uh, I called all over the country and there was none available. The only people that even knew about it was some people in eastern Iowa. So I told him, he said, well, I'll take them off and bring them in. So Sunday morning, Les and I, we didn't have breakfast or anything. We was out there early tearing those things apart. But I got to check in the parts books and found out that many of the parts between the pump and the motor on the two-speed were common. Uh, it's actually the size of it and all of this made them actually look the same, but they were not. The servos were different. But anyway, we'd, we'd take a piece out of the pump, which was good. It didn't get contaminated. So we take, we, we ne really needed the rotating part. If you know anything about hydrostats, you'll know what I'm talking about. So that was good in the pump. So we take this and put it over here. 
we take another piece out of the motor and we needed the plates desperately and that's the things that direct the flow of the oil in it. Well, thankfully those were okay, so we put them in this pile. And we kept gathering from one to the other and until we had the pile pretty well complete. We put this pump together at about noon time and uh, we was getting, we, we was going to eat before we went out there in that field. But the customer says, hey, let me take them out there. My, my guys know what they're doing. They can put it on there. So I said, okay, but on the one, you've got to do it exactly like I told you. I said, you put the oil in it, you let it sit there for 15 minutes. Then you put the transmission out of gear, the hydro out of gear, out of swash, and run it for another five, 10 minutes. Then with it out of gear, you go forward swash for so many minutes, and then you go reverse swash. And I said, I won't guarantee this thing for one bolt because, uh, but anyway, we ate, went out in the country, and we was coming over this hill. We seen this combine coming out of a driveway down there and headed out down the road. So, and uh, that booger run for three years. I know where after that because I kept track of it. <laughs> so everybody says, "Oh, you can't, you can't mix parts, but uh, you can." <clears throat> I guess when, New, when we went to New Zealand, that was uh, the first. I guess I'll get back and tell you, when I retired from the company, I wanted to retire at 55. And after about a year, they said, well, okay, you can retire at 55 if you travel for five years for us. Well, that was kind of an open invitation, but, uh, uh, and my retirement asked, really lasted 15 minutes. Uh, they called me one Monday morning and said, hey, you're done, you're retired. Have a good day. And my daughter there lived up the road a little ways, brought the wine bottle down, and we just poured a couple of glasses, and Mother and I sitting there with her. And, and when they called me, I says, this can't happen because we're in the middle of a uh, teaching at the University of Missouri. We've got 40 students up there, and this one man can't handle it. He said, oh, we find somebody. Anyway, before we got that glass emptied, the phone rang and said, you got to be in Columbia in the morning. And that started my second time. 27 years with the old company and wound up 26 years with the next company. So uh, my retirement didn't last for much. But then after the school, they said, we need you to go to New Zealand. So I said, okay. I went to New Zealand and they sent me over there to uh, Auditor Warney. Their, their warrant figures wasn't agreeing with the company's figures, so it took me about two weeks to go through all of their warnings and audit that. And, and whenever you went anywhere, you always went for a month. It's, you didn't go for no 10 days or whatever generally. But anyway, in that time, why I got to talking to their service manager over there, and I said, I said, what's all your problems over here in New Zealand? He said, oh, we have terrible problems with uh, people complaining about fuel uh, expense and powertrain failures and everything else and so I said well why don't we have a, a customer meeting uh, on uh, preventative maintenance and so forth he said it'd be great so we had that one and it was like creating a ball of fire everybody then wanted to have it but uh, what they were doing is they were terribly overweighting their tractors. They'd have enough wheel weights on the rear end to uh, one side to hold the whole tractor down. Same with the front weights, and they fluid in the tires and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so I told the guys, I said, you need to take half of those weights off, get rid of that fluid out of the front tires, and uh, you'll eliminate most of your rear end problems. See, you've got to have seven percent, minimum of seven percent wheel slip on any power tractor or whatever it is. Actually, that's your relief valve for your powertrain. And if those rear wheels can't slip a little bit, you don't have any relief valve. So consequently, 
you let the engine RPM come down, your torque goes through the ceiling, and you're just wringing those gears out like it wringing out a war rag. And anyway, we had several of those the first time I was over there, and and, uh, and then they wanted to have some dealer meetings. But anyway, I used up the last two weeks uh, with going out and talking to customers and so forth. And uh, well, I came in one day, and they had a new German tractor. It was a low profile, about 110 horse or something like that. And it had a disc on it, and they said they'd been demonstrating. And they says, you know, I don't know what's the matter with this tractor, but we can't keep it on the hillside. Well, in New Zealand, uh, most of that doesn't erode, so they farm over here where you wouldn't even think of it. Uh, and they said, the nose keeps coming down here. We just can't keep it up here. Well, they had full basket weights on it. They had front tires full of fluid. They had the back end full, uh, filled up with weights and fluid in the back tires. And I said, I'll tell you what you do. You take fluid out of those tires, take half of the weights or better off the back and half the weights off the front, and then I want to see the tractor out here in the, in the dirt. And so the next morning they brought it out there and, and uh, uh, actually the rear wheels were pushing the front. And so I said, okay, let's start putting, putting air in the front tires. And actually two pounds changed that system from uh, pushing to pulling. And they took it out that day and I, well, that night when I come in and seen the guys at the office, I said, well, how'd you do? He said, well, it says we kept it on the hillside and we gained the gear. And uh, so uh, most people don't take that in consideration that over ballast costs you lots of money, costs you a lot of repairs. Anyway, so much for that one. Uh, I had another thing happen when I was traveling on territory that uh, was kind of interesting. I had a, I always had a lot of training. I, I'm, I'm a guy that believes in teaching the people so you don't have to do their job. Anyway, we had this meeting, it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting, probably had 20 students there. And he came, one of the guys came up and says, you know, uh, so-and-so over there, he can't read nor write. And so I uh, thought about that for a while. How in the world do you teach somebody that can't read nor write and uh, when you're getting into schematics? And I always, uh, any class I ever had, I always had an hour of schematics. You had to learn schematic theory. So I decided the best way to do that is I asked him to come up front I gave him the pointer, and I talked to him all the way through that schematic, and had him point it out and rehearse it, and a lot of times have him explain to the class, because schematics are very tricky, and if you don't know how to read schematics, you you ain't got anything. So anyway, uh, that happened, and I understood afterwards that uh, it was a complete success with him. He did. A, he learned how to read them, and uh, so you never know. Then I had another little, couple little deals. You know, I had a, a district manager back at this time that uh, if you had a problem, his main answer was fix it. <laughs> so one of the sales guys sold a, a little tractor and a small loader to a concrete company out in Kansas, middle part of Kansas. And it was to load creek gravel into the trucks themselves, into the hopper on the truck. And this little loader, it was just great for that. Only thing of it was, it wouldn't raise a gallon bucket of water. So anyway, uh, he called me. I was down in southern Missouri, and he says, you got to be in Kansas in the morning. We've got a sale out there that if we don't have it done in two days, we've got to take it all back. And uh, I got out there, the, the serviceman that worked with me out of Kansas City had started it. He or, already ordered most of the parts I needed. But anyway, we had to completely build a hydraulic system for that loader. 
So to begin with, we had to build a reservoir. So uh, I drawed out what I wanted with the reservoir and where I wanted the baffles and all that and took it down to the welding shop. They built it. We had to go to bigger cylinders, three inch cylinders, so they were, the rods were too long, so we had to cut them off and have them reboard. And uh, we started to put the, put the front pump on with the mounting that's supposed to work on this little tractor and we were that far away from the shaft in front, so we had to have it modified. So all of those things uh, we struggled with and plumbed and got it all ready at about midnight the night before, and we had to go out and get some special fittings for the cylinders. And they were about that long. So when we put them in the cylinder, we weren't thinking. We put this on the top of the cylinder, so when the cylinder came back, problem. We, we worked it and it worked great and finally we decided well we raised it all the way up. Here we are at midnight and I raised it all the way up. I was on the tractor and there was a click and a boom. That loader bucket hit that concrete like a rock and oil went all the way up. Well it so happened that he knew the guy at the hardware store so we called him up and got him out of bed and he went out and got us two more fittings. So we turned the cylinders over 180. <laughs> Tried her again and man it worked. It was almost like using a scoop shovel. It was so fast. Took it down the next morning to the company down there and they tried it. They liked it. And there again I never heard from it again. So. <laughs> And we was always getting into something like that. And I had another deal where a guy sold a, a tobacco farmer over in Glasgow, Missouri, a little dozer tractor. Well, <laughs> he hadn't sold very many dozers or anything about it. But in, anyway, the guy called in. He says, that thing won't push, won't dig nothing. Well, I went out there. And here again, district manager called me up and said, hey, you got to go out there and fix that situation. We don't want that crawler back. <clears throat> what he had sold him was a fill blade. It wasn't intended to go in the ground. It scooted on top of the ground. And uh, so I called him back. I said, what do you want me to do with it? And he said, well, fix it. So we did. We took the blade off, the, the cutting bar off, went in and cut back on all the other parts of it. And put an angle into it and put the gussets in, put the blade back on, took it back to him the next morning. And he got onto it and like it had been, I guess, going ripping down through and dropped that blade and he put in a fellow with the front of the tractor. But anyway, that was a lot of the things that we did and, and uh, now getting into the pro harvest. Uh, the intent as I told you in the beginning here, was nothing more than to keep those machines in the field and we did whatever it took to make it happen. At one time we had over 3,000 parts on that old semi and when you drop it on the tractor it would just grunt but uh, we had to start scaling back on it because we were getting overweight. Uh, <clears throat> but we generally parked at the dealership. We did for the first four or five years. And Dan and I discussed this, and, and I said, okay. Uh, so I would park my motorhome at the dealership. Well, you can imagine how convenient that was for everybody. And uh, one or two o'clock in the morning, sometimes a guy that had driven 50 miles or whatever would bang on the door and says, I need such and such. And you'd get a flashlight and go out in the trailer, dig out what he wanted, find out who his dealer was, and, and uh, give him the parts, charge them to his dealer. Uh, we never sold anything direct. Everything that we took off of that trailer in parts went through the customer's home dealership or else he paid for it at the local dealership. Uh, we were not a wholesale or retail sales place. But every part had to go through a dealer somewhere. And in most cases, all we'd have to do is call our dealer in North Dakota, Minnesota, wherever it was, in most cases Canada, and uh, they would set up a list. So all we had to do is notify them if they needed parts. And we, uh, 
like I said, when we was at the dealership, uh, my wife, when she was traveling with me, she didn't appreciate that too much. But anyway, <laughs> we kept the guys happy. And we made several changes in the old girl as time went along. And I made a little list of them here. Uh, when we started out, the rotor screen turned the wrong way. Back on the, talking about the clean air screen, rotary screen. The way it turned, it would bridge material in behind it and stop the screen. We got that one reversed, fixed that problem. And uh, we went to wider concaves, higher rotor speeds. And uh, also we decided if you take two impeller blades off, you could have more input. And so we did that and that finally wound up being uh, thing that happened. Uh, now then, uh, we ran when we got into Montana with the 1660s one year, extreme north Montana, wasn't but about 10, 15 miles from Canada, those people raised solid stem wheat. Anybody know what that is? Anyway, they raised that solid stem wheat up there. Well, this year, with the 60s, we had fires over the right side of the rotor up around the jack shaft. And you'd get them stopped, and they'd do it again. Well, one day we had a fiasco. We had five machines on fire at the same time. Les was down the road fighting two of them, and I was fighting three of them. And, uh, uh, the customer's crew was fighting them. They had two of the three had them put out. The southern smoke was just boiling out from under the hood of the combine. And, and uh, <laughs> you ain't going to believe this one. Anyway, they even used the ice out of the coolers. And I was walking around this one and I thought, well, we're just going to have to give up on this one, I guess. And I'll never know what made me think of it or whatever, but I kicked a can of beer and a can of Coke. And I thought, well, I'll try this. Well, up on the on that jack shaft, there is a rubber seal that's split. And you can pry it apart and look down towards the front of the combine on that shaft. So I got up there, I shook that Coke up, squared it down in that place where it was on fire. And also, I for good measure, I used the beer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, put the fire out. Now the only thing I can figure uh, is the coke sucked all the oxygen out. So, but anyway, we, we saved the three combines and come to find out, we well, to fix the problem, we had to fix it fast. So we went to town, got some sheet metal and some dog chain, and we put what we called a diaper over the top of the combine, uh, the, the rotor uh, housing on that side, the cage, and they could, kept, they could keep running. And we had an engineer came out from the plant, worked on it, and uh, came up with a little impeller blade and so forth to go in there, but the, the, uh, uh, the metal over the top served the best. And when we finally got down to the answer, in manufacturing, they'd put in a one extra row of holes, which allowed it to, the material to shoot right straight up into that corner. And when it did, it wedged in behind the shaft. So it was a, actually a manufacturing error on that particular machine. Didn't hurt a thing anywhere unless you got into that solid stem wheat. But uh, it's kind of a scary thing when you uh, start looking in one of them things and, and smoke is coming out the back and it looks like it's a forest fire. So, uh, but anyway, it all gets back to you figure out how to keep it running. And we did that. Uh, so anyway, another little situation that I had, I had all kinds of them over the years is, uh, I always like to have safety meetings for my dealers. 
one a year. And I had this one set up down in southern Missouri, or in partially, I guess you call it South Missouri. But and I noticed this gentleman sitting there, and we had had in that area a man get in the baler. Well, so helped me that that man was sitting there. And we had some, we didn't cut anything out of those safety movies. If it, if it was bad, it was bad. And we showed it. And so I thought, well, I've got to do something about this, because I went, and I went down and talked to the guy, and I says, you know, this film that I'm going to show has exactly what happened to you. And I want to know how you feel about it. Should I go ahead and run it, or should I skip that part, or whatever? And he says, well, I'll tell you, son, if I'd have seen that film last year, I wouldn't be in this wheelchair. So we get into all kinds of situations where you have to make snap decisions. And uh, I've wandered away from our combine uh, harvesting and so forth, so I'll pick up a little bit here and get on with it. Anyway, after uh, I went to China twice, uh, actually it was like going into a different world at that time. Back in, back in 1984, uh, they were still archaic. Uh, but they wanted me to go over there. They wanted to know what happened to six combines that we'd sold them in 1978. Well, those machines were still like new. But there again, I got involved in other things with them. And when I got back to the United States, they had sent a message. They wanted me to come back for the fall harvest. Well, and so then from there, that's when Mother and I got in our RV and made the run from Texas to Canada, locating where we were going to work with Pro Harvest, the stops, and follow the harvest itself. And <clears throat> we did. I uh, also made a, sh a short stop when I went to China the last time in Korea. We had a 20 over there that they wanted to set up for rice. And it, we just got it in off of the ship. We had to put four foot tracks on it. And man, you talk about something like somebody had oversized shoes. It was the way it was. Uh, we got it. Raining all the time, we were working in water, but then inches of water all the time. They wanted a cho chopper in it, and I told them they didn't need a chopper, and they said, well, we bought a chopper, we want a chopper. So we had to rework it to get it in there. Got it ready to go, didn't have any key. So the guy says, take the lock out and I'll fix your key. <clears throat> and everything ready to go, we were running it, and everything was great. So here come the farm manager. He says, it worked? Yeah, it works. He says, you okay to run it? And I said, yeah. He said, let's go. So I really didn't have any idea what he was planning, but we take out of there, still raining, go down the road for about a mile or two, I don't remember how far it was, where the, we started into all the patties. And uh, I thought we were just going to take the machine up there and wait for the weather to clear up. He goes over and dives into one of them patties, had about, oh, 10 inches of water in it, and there's about that much of the rice sticking up. And uh, I was really nervous. Water was running out of each end of the header. And I, I look around and see that rice coming in, and it was coming in in clumps, but it was good rice. We get done with that patty, and Still raining. I said, what are you going to do with that rice in the tank? I thought, well, he'd say, we're going to just leave it in there. Oh, we're going to dump it out in the road. Well, I didn't have any idea how we would be able to auger wet rice. So when we got out there and he swung the unloader tube out, he said, push it. I finally did, and it just dumped it right out there. I, I mean, it I couldn't, be, couldn't have been any better. So uh, 
the next day we were out there and I was watching them as they were doing the patties and this helicopter landed there on the bank. An old gentleman got out of it and came over there and said, how's it going? And I told him, well, everything's going right, I thought. And he says, I'm Mr. Hyundai. So we visited for 45 minutes or whatever, and he says, well, everything looks good to me. I want you to be sure and come down and see our uh, complex. He had back in his little chopper and he was gone. But I did go down to see the complex, but mercy's sakes, it was about half the size of this town. So uh, Hyundai is a tremendous company. They build bridges, they build ships, they build everything you can think of. How they can get around the building cars is beyond me. But and then another little time, I always get in, I let my mouth get in me into trouble once in a while, but uh, uh, when I was in Germany, we were going down the Autobahn about 120 miles an hour, and this Frenchman and Englishman sitting in the front, or a German and a Frenchman sitting in the front seat arguing, which they always did when they got together. And he was trying to explain to him how the hydraulic clutch worked on the combine, the separator clutch. And I listened to him for a while, and I says, you're wrong. Well, you tell a German they're wrong, you, you know you better be a little ways setting away from them. But anyway, I was in the back seat. He turned around and he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you, you, you're, you're wrong. The flow doesn't go that way. Well, I don't know how come, but anyway, I had a schematic of that in my suit, in my briefcase, and had it laying there in the seat beside me. And like I say, I don't, I don't even remember putting it in there. But anyway, I just handed him that, and he looked at it for about 30 minutes. And he says, I'll be damned. I've been teaching it wrong all of this time. <laughs> and, and so anyway, uh, we were great friends after that. <laughs> Well, anyway, when we started this harvest thing, with the first trip at Mother, when my wife was with me, uh, we were having a terrible time with the header lift valve. We had replaced that, put a new valve on it, and some of the times it would work for a day, half a day, or whatever, and you could replace it, and it may work, and it may not. And uh, matter of fact, I had six of those valves under my driver's seat on the motorhome, and. Uh, I had finally got irate about it, and they Cam came out, and one of the, our engineer came out, and we had an engineer from the manufacturer that built the valve, and we met at Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, and he tested all of my valves. Oh, there's nothing wrong with those valves. And I, said, da, 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 and I said, I know better. So anyway, we had tried everything that we could, and finally we got a great big corn head on the front of that thing, and we finally got the valve to malfunction. And it was so simple when we found out what it was, it was almost embarrassing. Uh, that valve had two flow dividers in it, one for the uh, steering and, and one for the lift. And the two pressures for the the system on those two were too close, so consequently, they would sit there and, and flutter until and they, they stuck. So was all we had to do is add a couple of shims under the spring on the uh, working side, no more problem. And, but uh, our engineer says, no, that's not the problem. That's not it. The guy that made it said, that's it. You guys found it. So. That's kind of the way that uh, some of those things are. It, uh, you have to do what you know to do, and not always is everybody going to say, yay, that's great. Uh, with, with most engineers, and they're all great people, uh, they don't like to give an inch. They don't want to redo what they've done because it was perfect. But anyway. There's one thing about the pro harvest thing. It's if you took the job 
And we had finally put on the second trailer and hired more people. There was no such thing as a regular day. You could always guarantee that you had at least 12 hours, and a lot of them were 18 hours, and some of them be all overnighters. Because uh, when we had a problem, we lived with that thing. And uh, it wasn't uncommon. I remember one time she went with me, and we'd, one night we put on about 400 miles because the truck company had dropped our parts at the wrong place. And uh, we got back, I think, 4 o'clock in the morning. But the guy got back in the field at 10 o'clock that day. So it was things like that that uh, go with it. Uh, we had some pushback from management. And we had one incident where the guy said, well, I'm going to kill that project because it's too expensive. And uh, so we, Dan and I visited one day about that, so we decided it would be a good thing if we had a field day for the management people out of Racine. So he set it up in Racine, I set it up in the dealership, and we put the first one in Oneida, <coughs> South Dakota. And it was what I would call a real success. Uh, went over big. That's when Dan sent the straw choppers out in the, in the company's jet. So the next year we planned one in Glasgow, Montana. And it was bigger and as far as I was concerned, greater. Uh, we had four combines out there for those guys to run. That We came out and we'd have uh, 10 o'clock, we'd have uh, coffee and donuts and keep right on working. We'd have a working lunch and work right on through lunch. There's always something going on. And, and uh, send them to the field. Some of those guys, I don't think they ever seen a combine. But anyway, they had four planes and 100 acres to play in. And that one went real great. But one of the best things that happened during that time as I was sitting there with one, of the, with one of the VPs, he says, what's your biggest complaint out here? And I said, well, Dealers are just having a fit because they have to spend a week on those machines before they can release them to the customer. And I said, it's chains, it's belts, it's this, it's that, it's just Mickey Mouse stuff. And I said, those machines need to be field ready when they roll out of that plant. Well, that was, I never thought any more about it. So in November, I had a phone call. He said, would you go to the plant and audit, with, get somebody with you and audit those customer machines. We did, and uh, I had a little feedback the next year on that from one of the guys in there. He said it redu reduced the warranty about 30% or whatever, but uh, anyway, having the uh, management people in the field, they saw what we were doing, how we were doing it, and it opened the gate. And I would have to say this, that Dan was always my anchor man. I'd do something and then call and tell him I'd done it. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I can't praise him enough for keeping that end of it up. And all the other guys, we had support from everybody. At one time we had engineers that would come out and spend a week with us. And they'd go back shaking their head, and I didn't know it was that bad, or this, or that, or whatever. One electrical engineer came out and crawled up on top of the machine, and he said, well, how's that dirt and all that oil got on that, on that why, why is that all down there? And I said, well, ain't you ever seen one before? <laughs> and I said, that's where the dust and the dust settles. And he says, well, that, that ain't right. That can't be. And I says, well, you done it. <laughs> But anyway, uh, we had fun. We picked and we had some quarrels and whatever, but we always got them settled. But our motto was keep them running and if you fix it. So with that, Dan, I think I'm about done with this unless some of the guys uh, got some questions they want to ask. But uh, I... Uh, Got a little something from you. I got some stuff in the mail the other day, Dan. Come here. 
answer you. <laughs> Since you were involved in this, and it survived for 30 years. Wow. I thought I'd share that with you. And here's your cap. Ed, thank you very much, very much. <laughs> We're, we're not quite done yet. I think you've observed that over the years, when we had issues at Harvester and later at Case IH, there was, you always have certain identified go-to people to address and, and to analyze and to, to deal with, with, with certain issues, hydraulics, whatever it might be. And Ed clearly was one of those go-to people. And uh, he, uh, through his study and, and uh, never overreacted, it was always my balance beam. That's what I called him. It was always my balance beam. He was always analyzing and careful not to overreact. Now, I have to also tell you that there were a couple of times, maybe more than a couple of times, that we did the, the forbidden thing which in the manufacturing world is called unauthorized modification. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you do unauthorized modification, it does create issues. But we also recognize when we had some issues that Ed could clearly talk about overheating and such, that we were about to lose several, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm exaggerating, I say that several custom cutters with big machines because in just a few hours it would overheat. So we, we uh, went to engineering, and engineering at that point in time wasn't ready or didn't no. appreciate me calling the baby ugly. So, <laughs> so, 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 as, so as a result, we worked through what we needed to do, and, and, and we addressed the issue with some special radiator cores and so on. We saved a number of custom cutters and a lot of machines in the field. But it was because of the work and, the, and Ed's response to issues that we pulled it off. We had, net, we had another good problem while you're on that. I'll just give him one more. We had one where the machines would run out of power and mud. And uh, so we had to come up with electric fuel pump, booster pump. And engineering says, no, 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 that ain't it. So I said, okay, have it your way. I went down to the automotive place and bought six pumps, put them on, and went to work. And uh, so uh, those, those things, when we, when we had those uh, field days, changed the whole operation. It, in other words, instead of having to work our way up, if I wanted something, I would go to the top and come down. I'd call VPs off the golf course on Saturday, and, and uh, they'd go get things or make you things know, happen. Yeah, and they were receptive. And that's the thing I told you earlier, that whether it was in 41 North Michigan Avenue or Racine or where it was, Ed Powell had their attention. And I'm going to back off here because he can wind things up. You, don't, you, can't, you can't imagine how much this means to me. And thank you so I'm, much. I'm done. I enjoyed you guys a bunch. I thank you for all your attention. We could sit here the rest of the day and tell stories because in, in 50 years, guys, things happened every day and you handle it and went on down the road. And I can't help but say that with all the people that I really worked with, I've had the utmost cooperation. I'd call somebody and say, hey, I need this or need that. Out of the plant, we had a wonderful plant manager to help get this off the ground. And there was a lot of people out there lifting and we had to lift. It took five years to put it together, that's what it amounted to. And uh, so there's I put my hats off to a lot of people because I don't even have names for but with that you guys have been great thank you very much <laughs>